Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to our special testimony time. And it's wonderful, uh, it's a privilege and a joy to have today in sharing a testimony is a lady called Elizabeth Allen. Now, I just got to know Elizabeth just over the last few months. And uh, so she was very brave and very willing uh, to share something of her story of how she became a Christian. And I've asked Elizabeth and if had anything else that she would like to share and uh, with us today. So welcome, Elizabeth. It's lovely to have you here. And uh, it, it's good. And so, Elizabeth, maybe to share. Maybe you can, I don't know, start at the very beginning, if you like, sort of when you were born or whatever happened. And, and of course, the main thing is just share what the Lord has done for you, really, over your life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to share what God has done in my life. I was born a long time ago, right at the start of Second World War. <laughs> I was born, but and I've been a I've been a churchgoer all my life. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus. I liked the stories, and I I did pray, hoping that God would hear me. But I, as I say, I've been at church all my life. Sunday school, youth fellowship, joined the church, got married in the church, had my children christened in the church, but. When I was in my, it would be, I would be 40. I would be, no, mid-30s, mid sorry, mid-30s. My husband went back to study. I was left with five children. I agreed to this. I was left with five children on my own while my husband studied in Edinburgh and uh, I was teaching full time. So it was, a, it was a, but the Lord helped me. I know the Lord helped me. But towards the end of my husband's time at university, we were living in Perth at the time, we knew that there wouldn't be a job in Perth for my husband. We'd have to move, but that's by the by. But sitting in church, uh, it would be the Easter of 1977. The Easter of 1977. I was sitting in church and I found myself saying, Lord, I am bored. And I'm sorry to say that, but it was really a cry from my heart. I am bored. There must be more than this. And I found my mind wandering and preparing work with my children. You know, that was a classroom for the following week. I thought, this is not right. I am bored. There must be more than this. And this was a cry in my heart from Easter time onwards. And in the October, my husband uh, had graduated and he got a job in Dumbarton and we went to live in Helensborough. And when I was in Helensborough, my neighbours, quite a few of us, um, went to what we call Christian coffee evenings, which were held in Bear's Den every two months. I'd never been at anything like this in my life before. I just knew the church. That's all I knew. So those Christian coffee evenings were every second month, but not in the summertime. I went to these meetings with my neighbours. We were a mixed bunch. There was another, um, anyway, I won't go into all that right now, but we were a mixed bunch. We went to those meetings and I sat there and I, we, we, um, we had someone demonstrated icing cakes or something. We had a little supper and then someone spoke about Jesus. And I remember thinking, they're different. And what amazed me was they weren't ministers. That's how little I knew. They weren't ministers. And yet they spoke with authority about Jesus. I didn't know. I didn't know what they had, but I know clearly I wanted what they had. I didn't even know it was the Holy Spirit. That's the state I was in. I didn't even know it was the Holy Spirit. So I went to those meetings, thoroughly enjoyed them, and loved to hear what these people were saying. But we were only in Helensborough for two years, and then we moved up to Sutherland in the north of Scotland. And when I went to North, uh, up to Golspie, up to Northern uh, Scotland, I went to the minister's Bible study. And um, I learned a lot. This minister was born again, baptised the Holy Spirit, and I learned a lot with this elderly minister and his wife. Craig. Sorry? Sorry, was this the minister Miller Craig? Or was that yes, before? yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was lovely. Oh, you're and, lovely. Um, we, we, I, I, I mean, anyway, I went to those meetings, but sometimes, I mean, I was only 40 and every, everyone else was retired, but I wanted to go because I was always blessed when I went round. 
Then one evening we were, we'd been invited down to um, Bona Bridge and there was a house meeting there. And that's the night I was born again. I was sitting crying. I can only remember crying. And coming home in the car, I spoke to my older friend and said, you're sobbing away. Oh, what about my children? I didn't know all this before. What about my children? And my friend said, God will take care of the children. But it was real that night. And I had never known anything like this. But that night as I went to bed, I could see a bright light in the room and the words of the hymn that came into my head, I want to read them, was, um, it was, make me a captive Lord and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword and I shall conquer be. It's the next bit I want. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms and strong shall be my hand. You see, just after, that was Easter 1981, when I was born again. And we know that Satan is an evil person and comes to steal and kill and destroy. And right away, I was born again and fired the Lord. But my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And it was very difficult. He had an operation and he seemed, he seemed to be doing well. We were in the middle of building a house. Uh, there's a lot of detail I think I'll have to miss out. We were in the middle of building a house. Um, he was very, he, he had a big operation, but by the grace of God, we managed to get the house finished and he seemed to be doing well. Now, part of my testimony is my husband's testimony, if I can add all this in. Yeah, yeah. I had been going to the minister's Bible studies in the evening and coming back, I would say to my husband, now listen to this, listen to this, you must... And my husband, who's quite a patient man, said, OK, OK, uh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. I go to church. Now let me see the news. But being me, I keep on nipping, 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 nipping. Anyway, uh, my husband had the operation, appeared to recover. We finished the house um, by the grace of God. And then the cancer returned. Now, this is where the words of that hymn Imprison me within thine arms, and strong shall be my hand. Without the Lord, I don't know how I could have got through that, um, that time. We had five children. Uh, the older three, the oldest one was 20 when their dad died. Next one was 19. Next one was 18. Then I had two others at home with me, 15 and 12. But my husband uh, became more ill. It was obvious he, you know, it was not good. And I'm talking about 1984, a way up in the north of Scotland. And we had good friends who prayed for us time and time again. We, um, you know, and, and um, I would talk to my husband about the Bible, about Jesus. He was very ill. Um, it was a difficult time. It was difficult. And we had no Macmillan nurses. We had nothing like that to come and help us. But again, it was the grace of God that helped us through this. Now, my husband was a school teacher, just like I was, and he insisted on teaching almost to the end. But um, to get this right now, um, about three weeks before he died, he, he knew he couldn't go on to school any longer. So we both had permission from the head office to stay at home. And my husband was ill. He was very ill. And it was a difficult time, but I know God was with me and many, many people prayed for us. Now, what I should add is my husband was an elder in the local church, had been for years. He believed, I think he believed in Jesus, but found God difficult. I can't quite remember which one it was, but he was not born again. He was not uh, born again. Uh, and when we're talking about being born again, just to kind of clarify, that means I, really a committed Christian, really, a total Christian. Sorry? You know, the understanding of what born again is. Yes, yes. He, he had never asked Jesus into his heart. He, he didn't understand. He, he, was, he said, I'm fine the way I am. You know, I go to church. But um, it's amazing how God intervened. Now, three, uh, three weeks before he died, Friends of ours, um, they ran the Faith Mission College in Edinburgh, the Peckhams, um, yeah, we'll Mary and Colin. Yeah. Uh -huh. They were having a conference 
up in Sutherland, I can't remember where it was, outside in, in Sutherland somewhere, and we were supposed to go, but we couldn't because my husband had gone to the local hospital for a blood transfusion. But my friend who had arranged all this was determined my husband was going to meet the Peckhams and she told the Peckhams about our situation. The conference was Friday evening, Saturday and Sunday. And we were, we were at home, of course. And on the Sunday evening, there was a knock at our door. And this was Colin and Mary Peckham. Oh, come in, come in. And my friend had filled them in with all the details, you know, the background. Yes, yes. And um, my husband was lying down because the tumour by this time was huge. It was really huge. So we brought my husband through to the lounge and Colin and Mary Peckham, we made polite conversation about the beautiful view we had overlooking the North Sea. It was wonderful, the view we had mm -hmm. from our house. And um, then Colin Peckham turned to my husband and said, well, Peter, will you accept Jesus as your saviour tonight? And my husband nodded his head. I nearly fell off my seat. What a narrow escape. What a narrow escape. So Colin said, well, I will pray and you repeat the prayer. I went, mm -mm. he can't speak. The, the tumour is too big. So Colin prayed for him. And um, I've condensed all this to quite a shot. Colin prayed for him and then they went off. Now, um, he become, my, my husband became very ill. He was unconscious for part of the time. The local doctors were very good, but I was left to look after him. My mother came to help me with the younger two children. The older three were down south. And just before my husband died, I realized I couldn't go on any longer. The strain was too much. I was, um, I had shrunk to a skeleton <laughs> and I thought, Lord, I can't do any more. I can't go on like this. But that morning, before my husband died, now he'd been unconscious and when I tried to question him about the bank, the bank statement, I wasn't interested in bank statements. I let him do all that kind of stuff. And when I said, Pete, what's this, what's this, you know, in the bank statement, he didn't answer me. He was, he didn't, he wasn't conscious. But that morning, it was early in the morning and I'd left the room. I came back in and I should add, um, when he was so ill, he had a special mattress on the bed, I forget what, a ripple mattress, but he wanted me to stay beside him. So I was sleeping on a tiny bit of the bed and he came in and he pointed, sit down, sit down. And he was conscious and he looked me right in the eyes, focused like this. Now remember, he'd been unconscious, you know, and he said, he gave me a nudge, a nudge the way he would have done. Don't, what's it, eh, do not fear. I am with you always. And as he spoke, his face lit up like the light bulb. And I knew this was Jesus. He was speaking to me through my husband. That was the last words he spoke. Fear not. Do not be afraid. I am with you always. I will never leave you. Yeah. And it's the fact that his face lit up. And I know without a shadow of a doubt where my husband is and I just thank the Lord you know for um the way he carried us through his illness it took me a while to get used to this um I must admit I was a bit disappointed that he wasn't cured because we had loads and loads of praying for him but I've been assured that the bigger miracle is being born again not being cured for an illness so life became well, it was different. I had the younger two children at home. Uh, the, the older three were away, as I say, and I kept on teaching. But uh, as the older, uh, the older two, the oldest one, second youngest, sorry, was leaving school and the youngest one said, Mum, can we not go back down to Perth? And I felt that was right. Although I loved being up north and I had lots of lovely Christian friends, I felt it was right. My mother was still alive. There were reasons for coming down, reasons 
which I discovered later. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we, I was sorry to leave the village. I had lovely friends who'd really, really supported me while Pete was ill. But we gave, you know, we said goodbye, um, came down to Perth. Now the problem was this: was I going back to the church I had left, where I had, quite frankly, learned nothing? I'm sorry, yeah. but that's. Um, I could give you an example how I know that. Can I tell you? Yes, go on. No, why not? When my husband died, the day of his funeral, remember, Sutherland's quite a distance from Perth. Yes. yes. The minister, whom I respected and I liked, came up with his wife to my husband's funeral. Yeah. And after the funeral, we came back to our house. And one of my local friends, who was very good at socialising and making people feel at ease and welcoming them, said to the, my, my old minister, isn't it wonderful? Peter died a Christian. And my old minister said, Peter was always a Christian. Pete wasn't. He was a good man, but he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a Christian. So when I came back to Perth, um, I just didn't want to go back to the big church um, where I'd been, although they wanted me to go back and take over a Sunday school. I, I just, I didn't want to go back. So I decided, Lord, show me where I should go, because I knew it was important now. And I went round different churches. No, mm -mm, no. I found one church, which I liked, and it turned out their son had been at school with one of my sons, and we'd actually met each other years before. They were my age. They made me feel very welcome, but they didn't believe in speaking in tongues, and they didn't believe in healing. And although they were a lovely couple, I, I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't stay there. Now, um, let me get this right. I'll have to go back a wee bit. Okay, that's all right. All right, is it making sense? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I think we're putting it together quite well, yes. Okay. Yeah. Just after my husband died, he died in the June. And in the July, friends of mine used to go down to Inverness to the Full Gospel Businessman's Fellowship. Right. And I went down with them and I went regularly after that. And oh, it was wonderful. We didn't go home till late at night. It was, a, it was just a wonderful evening. I was teaching next day, but it was so wonderful. And through the Full Gospel Businessman's Fellowship, I heard about a conference in the November being held in Creef at the Creef Hydro. Right. And I, it was for families. And I wanted to go take my youngest two children with me. But I had a problem um, getting from Galsby to Creef on a November evening on my own. But I was very, we were very friendly with a minister in the Black Isle who had an elder who wanted to go to the same conference. He was on his own and we could just go in the car, it'd be fine. So we went, oh, that week, that week before I went to the conference, I was off school. I was never ill, but I was ill, really, very, very sick. And um, it was not good. And I thought, oh, I want to go to this conference. Um, so by the Friday, I forced myself to go to school. I couldn't leave the village on Friday evening, having missed school all week. So I uh, went to school on the Friday. I was feeling a bit better. Down to this conference. And the reason I'm mentioning it, this I look back and see how God has organised everything. Went to this conference. And it was organised by Mervyn Milne and his uh, father-in-law, Bill Kettles. They did, all the, they did all the full gospel. I had never been at anything like this in my life before. It was wonderful. And the testimony, I uh, forget the man's name, it was an amazing testimony of how God met his needs. I'd never heard this before. So anyway, this was me in contact with Pastor Mervyn Milne and his wife, Jane. They kept in touch with me. They came to visit me. And any time I came to Perth, I would go and visit them. So back to, I'm back in Perth looking for a church. So I went to the Christian Centre. Oh dear, they were all young. They were all couples. And I just felt like a sore thumb. So I went a couple of times and then didn't go back. And then I was invited, Pastor Mervyn got someone to phone me and invite me to a baptismal service. I'd never been at a baptismal service in my life before. I went along, came back to the centre for tea and sandwiches, 
And Pastor Mervyn said, well, Elizabeth, we haven't seen you for a while. What's wrong? I said, oh, I said, you're all young here and you're all couples. I don't fit in. Oh, he said, we've been praying for more mature people. And I said, are you winding me up? He said, no, I'm not winding you up. We're looking for more mature people. I said, right, just pray for me and I'm coming along to join. And it's amazing. I know God led me you know, to this fellowship. Um, I went to the Christian fellowship and um, I was still teaching. I got a job back in Perth. But after two years, I just decided that what was happening in the education system was not what I was trained for. And I phoned up the head office and I asked for, uh, oh, I found out about early retirement. I can see how God orchestrated it all. I found out about early retirement. I was only 50, but there was early retirement available. And it was my mother's neighbor who said to me, you're like me, you're single. I'm getting early retirement, you go for it as well. I went home, phoned the education offices and said, Elizabeth Allen, I would like early retirement. And he said, well, you're quite sure, Mrs. Allen? I said, yes, we'll put it, you know, we'll put it in force. And do you know that night, that afternoon, I felt physically a load being lifted off my shoulders. It was actually physical. So I left my teaching job, no idea what a pension would be. It was, and I went to work, I went to help in the Christian center because I knew I couldn't just be at home. I had to do something. And I went down there to help in the bookshop. I couldn't even answer the phone properly. I had to, I had to learn how, but I, um, I hope this is all making sense, but I gradually became more and more involved in the Christian center. I became a, a personal assistant to Pastor Merton. I was helping with the banking. I was doing all sorts of things. Um, being very, very involved, going off with the youngsters on cycling holidays, not that I cycled, I drove the minibus, um, lots of wonderful things, went on a Challenger bus around Scotland, visiting schools, you know, meeting the, lots of wonderful things over the years. And I can see how God, you know, um, I can see God had plans for my life. Um, since my husband died, I can see I've been really involved. Um, now, latterly, because I'm rather old, I am involved with the senior citizens at the centre and um, take my turns in leading meetings or, or giving a talk for 20 minutes or so and seeing people being born again. But I, mean, I think that's the main part of my story, that God had a plan for my life. Although I thought the, the end of the world had come when my husband died, because our life was very different. No more caravan holidays, no more tents, just me and the younger two children. It was very different. But looking back, God's hand was on me. He led me, he guided me. And um, I just marvel at what he's done in my life. And I've spent more time working on the Christian side than ever did in teaching in the schools. <laughs> but I just thank God for the way he's led me, guided me, been faithful, he's kept me. And um, the fact that I will meet my husband one day, I know where he is, praise the Lord. I just have five children needing to be drawn in. <laughs> so I think that's, um, I could give you another couple of wee stories if you want. One, one, one more wee story, it'd be good. Okay. When I was young, uh, a young woman, I was told I would probably never have any family. Mm. So if anyone asked me to marry them, I would have to say to them, marry me, you might not have any family, which is what happened. And uh, my fiance, well, my, my boyfriend said, oh, never mind, we'll adopt. I said, do you mean that? He said, yeah, we'll adopt. Why worry? So right enough, um, I had been in hospital and I had been under treatment, but I'm talking about 58 years ago. Things were different. So uh, we applied to adopt. Now, this is again where God stepped in. I was only 24. You're supposed to be 25 before you even take your name. My husband was four years older. And um, we, got a, we got a letter. We didn't even have a phone. 
we got a letter saying there's a baby boy waiting for you. It was not Perth, it was another city. And um, we arranged to borrow my father's car. We drove through and we'd been to see the caseworker before that. Sorry, I'm, we'd been to see the caseworker about adoption. Anyway, we drove through to Edinburgh, we drove through <laughs> and um, we met the caseworker who showed us this baby, about six weeks old. We said all the nice things. He's a lovely wee thing. Yes, fine. But I had to give a month's notice to the school. They wouldn't let me leave. I had to give a month's notice. But God's hand was in it. Eventually, they relented and said, well, all right, we'll let you off with two weeks because you can use your two weeks Easter holiday. So beginning of the Easter holidays, my husband picked me up from school, drove through to pick up the baby, and um, we got to meet the caseworker. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Allen, oh, we have a problem. We have a problem. The baby you were supposed to get has been held back. But don't you worry. I've got a little beauty here for you. Come with me. She took us to a, a, a lady's house who fostered children because there was a measles epidemic in the home. She took us into this room, and there was this baby, 12 days old. This was our baby for us, 12 days old. And um, I can see how God intervened. He even made sure we got the baby he wanted us to have. And I just add a wee bit to this. Although I wasn't a born again Christian when I was young, I used to pray, prayed a lot, prayed to pass exams because I wasn't brilliant, prayed to pass exams, prayed to have a baby, prayed, prayed, prayed. Well, Keith, the, the baby we brought home. I wasn't feeling very well in the car coming home. I felt kind of sick. <laughs> Keith's birthday is March. My daughter's birthday is December. <laughs> the same year. <laughs> yeah. so isn't God wonderful? That's amazing. So, 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 you, have, you say you have five children. Are they all adopted then? No, 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 no. Just one. Just one. You but you one. said you couldn't have children. Oh, no, no. Probably. Probably never. But they, they took me into hospital and did some wonderful things. Oh, right. No, no the other four. No, no, no. They, they, I, had three, I had three children in the pram at once. Really? He, he sat at the end of the pram, two-year-old. Yes. Yvonne sat on a wee seat in the middle of the pram. Mm -hmm. She would be, um, she was nine months younger. And the baby, who was two years younger than Keith, lay in the pram. I'd see babies in the pram. Wow. So God, after you'd had that. So after yeah. you adopted the first child, then yeah, yeah, yeah. you were able then to have children. Yeah, yeah. then another two later on. So but the Lord God, really has a prayer on that. Is, yeah, it's amazing. I, lots of stories. And <laughs> one more story if you want. Uh, Elizabeth, that is wonderful. Yes, I mean, it, it is. Um, as we say, our time is going, but um, as a verse of scripture, which is very important to you, which you feel has been a real blessing, can you think of a verse of scripture? Um, Oh, now, um, yeah, uh, there's lots of good scriptures I can mention, yes, but there's one in Joshua, uh, the end of Joshua, I think it's chapter 22, round about 24, there's lots of scripture verses, but it says Joshua spoke to the Israelites just before he departed this world, yes. and he said, there's not one thing of all the good things God has promised that have failed to come to pass. And that really encouraged me. God gives us wonderful promises and there's not one thing that has failed to come to pass. But there is a hymn that I really, really enjoy singing. Yes. And it's, all the way my saviour leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, there with oh, something to dwell. For I know... Whate'er befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. And as I look over my life, and I see the way God has answered prayer many, many times, and I sometimes haven't liked what's happening, I have under understood what's happening, but God in his wisdom has guided me, kept me, protected me, comforted me, and meets my every need. He is the Almighty God, who does all things well, He is. That's lovely. And uh, okay, so 
finally then to the people who are maybe looking at this what's the most important thing you would say to them to people who are looking at just now looking at just now uh -huh. there's a, a verse in job that says acquaint thyself with the lord and be at peace oh. get to know him get to know him acquaint thyself with god and be at peace thereby good shall come unto you get to know god without god I don't know how I would have coped because when my husband died, I really was, um, I just felt like an empty, like an empty Easter egg. There was the shell of me. There was nothing left. If I hadn't had God, I'm a Christian friend, but if I hadn't had God to lead me and guide me, I don't know how I would have coped. I, I, I just would have found it very difficult. Um, I just think trust in the Lord. And I have been able to encourage people about this business with babies. I've been in many staff rooms over the years. And I've heard people say, oh, they can't have babies. I say, oh, don't say you can't have a baby. Look at me. <laughs> and I've encouraged them. I've encouraged them. You know, that don't say never. God is well able. And I know God heard those prayers. Wonderful. Just, I know God heard the prayers. Um, he's my provider. He's my all in all. Um, I can't, my mind's gone blank as far as scripture's concerned. <laughs> my mind's gone blank, but he is my all in all. The, the eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and nothing can snatch us out of his hand, nothing can separate us from his love. He's a faithful God who will remain faithful from, you know, day after day after day. We're blessed. We're ble I would just encourage people, get to know God. Give him an opportunity. Okay. Speak to him. Well, just hold on a minute then, because I'll let you just to pray for us in a moment. But just before we do that, uh, if you're looking into this testimony of Elizabeth, I'm sure you've been encouraged by it. I really have. And it's, as you can see, it's unscripted, it's unrehearsed. And just Elizabeth is just sharing from her heart. But of course, she was explaining the most important thing is to do is to acquaint yourself, get to know God. Mm -hmm. We see his peace, his friendship, forgiveness. And to be, as Elizabeth has shared, is to be born again. Now, sometimes yeah. people say to me, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a born again Christian. Well, really, you can't <laughs> be a Christian without being born again. But how do we become born again? What does this mean? Is it something different or, mm -hmm. or not really? As Elizabeth explained about her husband, Peter, and it's just about receiving the Lord Jesus yes. as your Lord and Saviour, simply by praying to him. And just saying, as uh, we heard that testimony of, of Colin Peckham, mm -hmm. people accept the, do you accept the Lord? Yes. yes. And so, again, just to you looking in today, I would like to ask you the question. Do you accept or will you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour? Maybe like Elizabeth, you've been to church for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're, you're a very kind and loving person. Maybe you think, well, I'm not a bad person. But well, the Bible explains that all of us have done wrong. You would accept, most people accept that. We've all done wrong in some way. Mm -hmm. Because the fact we've done wrong, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's son, he died and he took our punishment on the cross to save us from sin and to the place called hell. Because Jesus wants to give you eternal life and for you to have this peace that Elizabeth was speaking about. So as we come to a conclusion today, I'm just going to ask you, will you accept the Lord Jesus? And so I'm going to say a wee prayer. And if you would like to say this prayer with me, and then afterwards, I'm going to ask Elizabeth just to say a prayer for us. So first of all, would you like just to do that? If you're looking in today and you need Jesus to come into your life, or you need something for forgiveness for something you've done wrong, Jesus is here with us. Just like Elizabeth said, God's with us. Jesus is with us, he's with us here today. So we can just pray. And if you'd like to, maybe you'd at least like to say this prayer. And it's good to say it out loud and simply say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for what I've done wrong. Forgive me my sin. I ask you, to come and live in my life, in my heart, to give me your Holy Spirit. And that assurance of a place in heaven with you, 
thank you, Lord Jesus, that you will love me and you have promised you will never leave me. Amen. And Elizabeth, would you just like to pray for us now? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your faithfulness, your mercy. And thank you for sending Jesus, who took the punishment for our sins. I thank you, Lord God, for coming into my life. But Lord God, for causing me to understand the gospel. I thank you, Lord God, that my sins are washed away. And I pray for everyone who watches this testimony, that Lord God, you will speak and minister into their hearts and cause them to see their need of a savior. Not just knowing about Jesus, but understanding what Jesus has done for us on the cross. His blood has purchased our salvation. His blood has washed away our sin. And Lord, and having accepted Jesus, we know that we are accepted by you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your faithful, your kindness. Oh, Lord, we just honour you, we bless you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> thank you so much. That was such a, that was so refreshing. And thank you so much for being today. And, uh, I hope it's all right. <laughs> And if you appreciate this and you enjoyed it, please pass it on to somebody else. Again, of anybody you think this, this story, Elizabeth's mm -hmm. could be helpful. So thanks for looking in. Bye-bye. <laughs>